There are a few things more satisfying to me in my downtime than getting in this camper, putting the key in the ignition, and hearing it roar to life. But in the last year and a half we've owned this camper, that hasn't exactly always happened. So this morning, I'm going to go through and outline some of the starting problems we've had and what I've done to fix those. So you can see that I'm underneath the camper here and you're taking a look at my new high torque starter. And I put this on here because the other one simply wasn't up to the job. After I had started the camper for a little bit, the engine would warm up, which meant the compression increased in the engine and it was harder to turn over and that starter just had to work harder. The other problem was the old starter, although it was much bigger than this one, had a problem that they develop after a while, which is called heat sink. Basically, when they get hot, they don't work as well. And so after it had warmed up and the engine had warmed up, the starter didn't work as well and it was had to work harder because the compression was greater. So all things considered, this has really worked well even though it's smaller. If you're looking at replacing one of these, these are pretty easy. There's just two bolts here and here. And then there's a connector back here that you have to be careful with and install correctly. They recommend that you get new cables. But as you can see, um, I did not. These look to be okay and I didn't want to spend money on it right away until I knew it worked. So that's the first issue. Once I had this replaced, it cleared up my starting issues 100%. The next electrical issue I had is related to the alternator. And this thing is not that hard to replace. It was a bolt here, and there's a bolt down here. And then I just set this up for demonstration purposes, but if you look down there, there's a jack, and I have a board connected right here. And you just basically it, you tighten this one up most of the way, then you leave this one loose, and you just jack this whole thing up until there's enough belt tension right here. And that's about how much belt tension you want. You want to be able to move it, but not a lot. In any case, the alternator had gone bad, but before I figured that out, a couple of interesting things happened. First of all, I ran my battery dead a couple times, and then one time when I was taking a trip, I'm driving along pretty nicely, and I noticed the engine is skipping, and it's getting worse and worse, and all of a sudden I hear this tremendous bang, and sometime later I found out that this had happened. The engine had not been burning the fuel, so it put the fuel into the exhaust system and then it backfired and blew my muffler completely apart. I've talked to a couple of guys that have had this happen before, but I have never personally seen this. I kept it just because it was kind of cool. So after I put a new muffler on, after I got a new battery, then I went back here and also replaced the alternator, which was like, I think it was 55 or 60 bucks at AutoZone. While I'm under here, I want to take a minute to show you all the components that are on the firewall because it took some time for me to identify what's all going on under here. This, of course, is just a multi-battery isolator. This is kind of a camper particular thing to keep the cabin battery from draining the engine battery. Down here, if you look down here, this thing right here is really old thing right here is the starter relay. I have a new one around here and I haven't installed it yet, but that is the starter relay. If that thing goes out, your vehicle will not start. That thing has got to be original. It's so old. I need to replace it. I have another one right here that I got from Rock Auto and I'll put that on in a while. So over on this side, across the master cylinder and the brake fluid reservoir, back here you have what's called the ignition ballast and that thing is also required. I have a new one of those too. This is the ECU, which I think stands for the Engine Control Unit. In any case, it's a five pin engine control unit and this thing just pops off. Again, if this thing goes out or doesn't work, your engine will not start. This is a voltage regulator, also called the alternator regulator. And what that does is it, it's basically an in external a voltage control regulator for your alternator. Today's alternators have them right inside the alternator, but this one's mounted on the firewall. And I just talked to a guy at a hardware store today who's redoing a power wagon. I think it's a 1978 power wagon with a 318 in it. And he said he's constantly getting his battery drained, had no idea why, and eventually traced it to this little unit. So that's all the electrical starting problems I've had on this thing over the last year and a half. I'm going to be putting some more videos up about the other problems I've had, especially the carburetor, which is a Carter Thermoquad carburetor. I had a good time going through that. 
So I'll be putting some more videos up about the carburetor and the engine over the next, oh, I don't know, months when I get to it. In the meantime, feel free to subscribe or just check back later. Thanks for watching. By the way, if you get online and see that there's a higher output alternator for a sale, and you think, boy, I could really use that for my camper because of the high voltage requirements, I would recommend that you don't buy it and then try to stall it, install it down there because it simply doesn't fit. This is for another engine. It might be possible to install it down there where the air pump used to be that pumped air through the manifold to deal with emissions requirements, but it doesn't really work unless you're a metal fabricator to install it over here. So I really wanted to do that, but it didn't quite work. And I just wanted to sh put a shout out there because you will notice there are two types of alternators available. This one does not fit this Dodge 360 engine, much to my disappointment.